Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, these were intense, argumentative, angry negotiations. We look inside the first round approval of the USMCA, plus the China deal. The farmers are going to have to go out and buy much larger tractors. We've heard it before, but the markets are reacting this time. And Sunny Purdue says 15 billion is 15 billion. And Dominic's Garden, a sweet story perfect for the Christmas season. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. By now you've heard that a deal with China, at least phase one, has been struck just before additional tariffs were set to take effect. The deal had been bouncing around back channels and the president's Twitter account, of course, for days. All things considered, it and the potential tariff rollbacks that may come with it comes at a good time. In the meantime, since it was announced, the markets have been moving. Peter Tubbs has more. Initial reports of the trade deal indicate that tariffs currently placed on Chinese imports will be rolled back and that additional tariffs scheduled to take effect on Monday, December 15th, would be canceled. Uh, this is a very large deal, the China deal. It covers tremendous manufacturing, farming, uh, a lot of rules, regulations. A lot of things are covered. It's a phase one deal, but a lot of big things are covered. And I say affectionately, the farmers are going to have to go out and buy much larger tractors because it means a lot of business, a tremendous amount of business. There may be a snapback provision that would reapply tariffs if China does not complete promised purchases. The anticipated amount is sales of 50 billion in U.S. agricultural goods during 2020, double what was purchased from American farmers in 2017. Analysts estimate that American businesses and consumers have paid over 40 billion in tariffs on Chinese products since January 2018. Harvest delays have encouraged the USDA to push the deadline for applications for the market facilitation program and dairy market coverage. The new deadline is now December 20th. The extension comes as dairy prices have declined 4% in the last two weeks, reversing an 11% rise over the last 90 days. Block cheddar prices have lost over 4% in the last two weeks after a 13% run-up since September. Grain producers have endured a late and wet harvest, with many still in the fields. Retaliatory tariffs have reduced sales of corn and soybeans to China by over 35 percent, lowering prices at the elevator below the cost of production for many producers. The value of agricultural exports to China in 2019 are down 11 percent compared to 2017. A third round of MFP payments for the 2019 MFP cycle may be issued in January 2020. The USDA has paid out $18.5 billion in MFP payments since 2018. Another trade deal was sealed recently, one that both American political parties had been pushing for, the USMCA, and one badly needed since NAFTA was essentially put into effect long before the Internet became such a force in global trade. Now all it needs is final signatures from the partner countries. Paul Yeager has that story. Three signatures from representatives of Mexico, Canada, and the United States led to cheers in Mexico City this week. The USMCA earned its first round of approval in November of 2018. And the result, I think, is the best trade agreement in history. I think it's going to do the most for manufacturing in this region. It's going to do the most for farmers in this region. It, it, it's, it's digital trade and e-commerce provisions are the gold standard. There are none better in the world. But the exact details and language have proven to be challenging and time consuming. Uh, a year has passed now and four months of that year we got to blame President Trump because it didn't move because he had uh, tariffs on aluminum and steel. So it took us five almost five months to talk the president out of that. Take him off. He took him off. And eventually, many of the hurdles were cleared by the groups working for passage. 
The pact nudges manufacturing back to the United States, requiring 40 to 45 percent of cars eventually be made in the countries that pay auto workers at least $16 an hour. We were in range for a while, uh, but until we could cross a certain threshold of enforcement for our workers' rights, for environment, and for the prescription drug issue. The pressure between parties involved in USMCA negotiations was palpable as they tried to balance what would earn passage in each country that was in the deal. These were intense, argumentative, angry negotiations. I mean, this got really hot on a number of occasions. Uh, I think we set a world record for hanging up on each other, myself and the trade rep. And, uh, but at the same time, we also knew that this was an opportunity that we couldn't let get away from us. Proponents of the USMCA wanted to have the deal ratified by the end of 2019 and out of the 2020 presidential election year. Supporters will have to wait for their gift to come in the new year. We will not be doing USMCA in the Senate between now and the end of next week. That'll have to come up in all likelihood right after the trial is finished in the Senate. Senator Grassley praised the support from former Obama Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack in seeking approval for the pact. The dairy industry may be one of the big winners of the NAFTA replacement. Vilsack is now the CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. Mexico and Canada currently import about one and a half billion dollars of U.S. milk products, more than 25 percent of all U.S. dairy exports. The pair made a push for passage back in August during a visit to an Iowa dairy production facility. The U.S. International Trade Commission, or USITC, says USMCA would increase U.S. dairy exports to Canada by $227 million as the Class 7 policy restricting imports is removed. Exports to Mexico could rise by more than $50 million. RCAF, the nation's largest producer-only cattle trade association, says USMCA is a win for agribusiness giants at the expense of cattle farmers and ranchers. Other U.S. commodity groups praise the deal as a chance to export more American-raised goods to their already major trading partners to the north and south. We're going to see a $34 billion investment uh, in manufacturing in the United States. We're going to see 174,000 jobs created. So I think that besides updating NAFTA, which was absolutely necessary, this is a very, very good piece of legislation. The USITC says USMCA would add $68 billion in GDP and increase food and agricultural exports by $2.2 billion. The Mexican legislature could sign off soon. The Canadians are likely to take the deal up in late January. So while the USMCA moves toward ratification, other issues continue to command attention. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue spoke at an ag convention a few days ago and said another round of MFP would be necessary. He also reaffirmed what he said was the president's plan for the future of ethanol. John Torpy reports. While giving opening remarks at the Farmers Business Network conference this week, U.S. Department of Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue brought some welcome news about ethanol. A crowd of almost 4,000 farmers and ranchers attending the fifth annual gathering, also dubbed the Farmer to Farmer Conference, learned the future blending limits for ethanol will be set at 15 billion gallons and will not be affected by exemption waivers. The president has gotten uh, the attention here and he wants to me to assure you that 15 billion gallons going forward is going to be 15 billion gallons. The small refinery waivers will still exist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the small refinery waivers will still exist, but you need to know that exemption is going to be accounted for on top of the line here for a net of 15 billion gallons. Blending requirements have been a sticking point for the biofuels industry, who have been at odds with the EPA over the issuance of small refinery exemptions, or SREs. The exemptions allow refiners to forego the federal requirement of blending ethanol into the nation's gasoline supply. 
ethanol industry officials have routinely challenged the waivers with the Trump administration, citing they diminish the bottom line for farmers in rural America. Farming's a business. I mean, we like to, we love it as a way of life, but it's got to be a livelihood as well. And we've got to ensure that our farming community across this country in a sustainable fashion is sustainably profitable in that way. Jeff Broin, CEO of POET, the nation's number one ethanol producer, welcomed the news with a bit of caution, saying the EPA needs to be held accountable to the agreement. For a farmer to get to sustainability, and to get to sustainability, he has to be profitable, we're going to have to use biofuels as the bridge. Broin added, getting back to 15 billion gallons could help reopen shuttered ethanol plants, bringing back jobs, and helping rural towns. Very exciting future, I think, for agriculture. If we can grow biofuels to E15, get the price of commodities up, make farming more sustainable, and drive cleaner fuels and a cleaner environment. In Southern Gardening, as you might expect, we get a lot of questions from viewers about their gardens. In today's mailbag story, Gary answers a couple of those questions, one about tomatoes and another one about the popular strategy of growing in containers. Here's Gary. box is always overflowing with landscape and garden questions from gardeners wanting advice and tips on how to be successful. Today I'm going to answer a couple of these questions and help you out too. Hey Doc, this year I want to start my own tomatoes from seed. What tips can you give me? John, great question. A fantastic way to get started is with a cell tray and clear dome. Sometimes they're called a seed starting greenhouse and have everything needed to grow more than enough seedlings for your garden. Your local garden center will have the supplies you need. A good time to start your seedlings is six weeks before transplanting into the garden. Follow the directions and next spring and summer you'll be enjoying fresh homegrown tomatoes. Gary, I want to start growing in containers like you're always talking about. What kind of dirt should I put into these pots? Lorraine, to be successful growing in containers, you have to use potting mix made for containers, which is much different than regular garden soil. When choosing a container potting mix, I always look for these ingredients. Sphagnum peat or core coconut fiber adds bulk and substance while being extremely lightweight and has good water holding capacity. And perlite or vermiculite, which provides aeration and improves water drainage. Use a potting mix with these ingredients and you'll be sure to grow like a pro. So keep sending me those questions to southerngardening at msstate.edu and I'll keep answering them as fast as I can. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a story sure to tug at your heartstrings. The story of a Mississippi master gardener who says that a chance meeting, a reluctant meeting, with a special needs child and his father turned into the mission of a lifetime. A geologist by training, he shares what he knows about dirt with children almost too precious for words. Stay with us for the story of Dominic's garden coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. Cancer is cancer, and uh, just to watch a uh, family member go through cancer, go, I mean, go through the suffering uh, is as hard as it gets. When my mom was sick, we'd text every day. I'd ask her things like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Uh, and I'll never forget one day she said, I just, I wish I didn't hurt today. Cancer took my mom in 2013. They didn't take her soul, they didn't take her spiritual, and she's always going to be with me. Get screened. It's the right thing to do. Stop it before it happens. Catch it early. Uh, do it for yourself and do it for your loved ones around you. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before we get back to the show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Just one item, a two-day intensive arborist preparation short course. 
Thursday and Friday, January 9th and 10th at the Agri Center in Meridian, Mississippi. The course includes content on tree biology, tree soil relations, water management, pruning, and a lot more. The cost is free with pre-registration by January 6th and meals for both days are provided. For more information, contact John Kushla at 662-769-9905. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. As we mentioned earlier, the reaction to the Phase 1 China deal was positive. In fact, when it was announced, the markets were all up, wheat, corn, and especially soybeans, on the news that China would be buying billions in commodities. So we asked analyst John Roach the obvious question, which commodity was the biggest winner? That's a real good question. Uh, we don't know any of the details, and so knowing uh, who's going to, uh, uh, to get the best benefit is a little bit difficult. But what we think is that the soybean market, uh, uh, a lot of the business that China has needed, they've come in and covered. And so there's just a small period of time between now and the harvest of the Brazilian crop uh, before they uh, uh, will be back competing with us. And so, so where you'd think maybe beans would be the biggest benefactor, it may actually turn out to be a some, another commodity, and uh, um, but until we know details, it, it's just really kind of it's just really hard to, to know. Uh, the, it was interesting in that the meat markets were much stronger today, along with uh, the uh, uh, grain markets, oilseed markets, and even the energy markets and gold markets. So all these markets were all stronger. And part of what's going on is that the commodity index is moving higher, and as the index moves higher, it drags even the weaker commodities higher. More now on that farm labor overhaul. Recently, the House passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, a bipartisan bill designed for the most part to address the ag sector's chronic labor shortage. It generally has broad support, and if it's passed by the Senate and ultimately signed by the president, it could make it easier for undocumented farm workers to work year-round. On the other hand, the American Farm Bureau has objected to the bill in its current form, saying it doesn't give farm Farmers a real leg up toward profitability. We would like to see more changes to the wage methodology. We want to limit litigation exposure for frivolous lawsuits. We want to see real program access for year-round farmers. We don't want to see caps on a year-round program. We want any farmer anywhere in any type of agriculture to have access to the workforce that they need at a price that won't put them out of business. Farm Bureau says it's hopeful that a Senate version of the bill will be crafted that could address its concerns. In the meantime, other ag groups have expressed support for the House version, including the National Farmers Union. NFU President Roger Johnson issued a statement of formal support for the House bill. In his statement, he says, quote, our current farm labor system is badly broken. It's a time-consuming, convoluted, and restrictive process for farmers and ranchers who often don't have the time to spare, and it's a dead end for farm workers who currently have no straightforward path for longer-term employment or legal status. On the hills of the passage of the House version, Mississippi Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson issued a statement to Farm Week essentially agreeing with the Farm Bureau. He said it's too much of a strain on farmers. In that statement, he says, quote, migrant labor has always been a component of our country's and Mississippi's commercial agriculture. Changes to our current workforce laws need to not add undue burdens on our farmers and respect our immigration policies. Any final legislation needs to reach a consensus that I don't believe was achieved in the House version of the legislation. We'll be watching to see how the Senate proceeds on the issues. The farm labor overhaul passed in the House on December 11th. It has now gone to the Senate. There, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat, has pledged her support. No word yet on who her Republican counterpart would be. And now a story perfect for the holidays. A master gardener who lives in Jackson, Mississippi, says he once heard a voice from above tell him to speak to a special needs child at a hospital where he volunteers. Now, two years later, he uses the power of dirt to reach out to those sweet souls. It's a part of his life he calls Dominic's Garden. 
Okay, let's put this in the ground. John Malinchek started out as a geologist. Poetic that he attended high school in McKee's Rocks, Pennsylvania, just outside Pittsburgh. The only A he earned was in earth science. When they come out, they're going to spread out everywhere. After high school, John wound up in the South studying geology, thanks to a friend who attended the University of Southern Mississippi and who recommended the school's geology department. John says he was led to the field because he loved the smell of dirt. And I'd be out there digging in it, looking for worms and just smelling that rich soil. That's what I fell in love with. After college, he wound up back north for a time, but his wife from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, wanted to come back home. Thus began a few decades of geology work for the Mississippi Geological Survey and for engineering firms thereafter. From 1975 until just a couple of years ago, he was immersed in this technical life. Then in 2017, he called it quits. And that's where his story really begins, when his wife encouraged him to take the Master Gardener program at Mississippi State. I signed up for it, and I fell in love with it because, it's, to me, it's all science. Um, it's not just growing flowers. It's why, is a, why does the flower grow? What does that insecticide do? How does that insecticide work on the nerve system? So that's how I study gardening. I did not want to be a gardener. I could have cared less. Two and a half years ago, I could have cared less. I wanted a nice yard. But there's another side to John Malinchak, his spiritual side. Driven by his faith, he volunteers at St. Dominic Hospital in Jackson. His experience there ultimately led him to working with kids. You find that they like to get dirty, just like I do. And that's a connection right there. These days, John leads the Mississippi Master Gardener Association, and he uses those skills to reach out to special needs children in a program of his own creation called Dominic's Garden. But he constantly harkens back to a time at St. Dominic when he had trouble just being around those who can't really care for themselves. I had an aversion to special needs people. And the aversion was I felt so bad for them and I felt that there was nothing I could do. I didn't want to get close to them because it actually, it hurt me inside. That hurt, he says, led to guilt. And then one day at the hospital as he watched a mother and father wheel their son, a special needs child with Down syndrome, out of the hospital, he heard a voice tell him to speak to the boy. The reaction from the boy's father changed his life. And as I touched the wheelchair, I looked up and the father was staring over the roof at me. And I, I didn't know what he wanted. And in a broken voice, very soft, he said, I want to thank you for speaking to my son. I said one word, goodbye. And I said it reluctantly. He did not say, thank you for speaking to my special needs son or my son with Down syndrome. He said, this is my son, and I thank you for that. Because of that moment, he dived deeper into his experience with special needs kids. And he came to learn something very important. Fran Patterson, like who the runs the Little earlier. Lighthouse, explains. These kids are not special. They just are um, differently abled. Um, we like to say not disabled, differently abled. Um, God gives us all unique gifts and talents and he gives us extra chromosomes sometimes. Sometimes he messes with the amygdala in our brain, such as the person with autism. Fran says John seems to have a strong bond with the kids and she knew it early on. John shows up with that beautiful table and says, now let's get busy doing what I'd love to do with kids. And he's never worked with kids, like he said, this age. He's always done junior high kids or mustard seed, and um, it's, it's fun. When they get out here, it's, it's a mess, but it's fun. And we have, whether it's through gardening, whether it's through physical therapy, uh, speech therapy, uh, we have an opportunity to change their lives, you know, for the better, rather than, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah, boy, that's you're putting a, a room somewhere. And that's where you stayed. Thank you. Again, we're put on this earth to change people positively. Um, and that's what I try to do with gardening, try to impact, I don't care who it is, impact them you know, positively that day. 
through gardening. The therapeutic benefits of gardening may seem obvious, but John says this kind of activity in this setting with these children provides therapy on multiple levels. Walking, stooping down, balance. That's just the physical part. Then there's the mental part. It's like um, working a crossword puzzle because there is a sequence to gardening. You dig the hole, you put the plant in, you cover the hole, and then you water. So there is a, simple, a, a, a sequence. Some people, they get confused on that, but you walk them through it. As John ponders how he will grow the influence and reach of Dominic's garden, one thing is certain. He's getting just as much out of it as the kids. So many times I'm the student and they're the teachers. There's a world of good out there. They share that with me. I just thank God for that. An amazing story, Dominic's Garden. If you'd like to reach out to John in some way, you can email him at this address, jmalinchak at comcast.net. No doubt he'd be very happy to hear from you. Well, next week, the first two parts of a four-part story, Back to the Farm, about one family's decision to move away from the city back to their roots in the country. Who steps in to help when longtime farm owners retire? And what about the kids? They'll have to learn a whole new way of life. Meet Joni, Zach, Colby, and Lucy, a family that a year ago said goodbye city, hello farm life. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching and Merry Christmas.